Cadillac, I think, has its own unique look. I think they truly do hold a very unique appearance of their cars. In a world where cars are all starting to kind of look the same, and that's been going on for many years, I think Cadillac's done a great job in carving out a unique identity through their grill, their crisp body lines, and they design in a subtle way that's somewhere between uh, racy and classy. There's always a hint of muscle, of strength, of power, but it's subtle. It's not obnoxious. It's not boy racer. It really does ride this kind of timeless, classic design to it. It's never overstated. I've seen some comments where said they wish they maybe pushed the design a little further, make it a little more flashy, but I think it's perfect. It's an understatement. It's a sedan that's not trying to be a boy racer. It's not trying to scream. The ATS V, the V models, oh, they look like that. They look like screaming performance. This car, design-wise, is right where it needs to be. It's a little more conservative. It's a little more quiet. Uh, a little more on the luxury side than it is the performance side, but that makes sense because it's not extreme performance. It's really good performance. This little four-cylinder really brings this car to life. Uh, the turbo, there's no lag. I was surprised. I haven't been in a turbo car since the 80s. This thing has no lag. It's just torque at low end. You can feel it straining against the tires when you take off from a light. You gotta go easy on the pedal. It doesn't need a lot of work to get this car moving. Uh, the engine's actually quite attractive uh, when you strip it down and take the covers off. Uh, it's a clean package. And I forget, because this car was designed to be rear wheel drive, the engine is mounted longitudinally. It's mounted in a line with the car, like classic cars of ancient history. And so there's something very pleasing about the aesthetic. When you look at this engine, the turbo's on the driver's side, and it's flanked on the passenger side, almost symmetrical, by the throttle body. It just has a beautiful balance to it. The overhead cams, the aluminum engine, uh, the intake, the exhaust. It's a very simple layout. It's very clean, it's very beautiful. And the engine has very usable power throughout its entire RPM range. And it's a very linear pull as the RPMs climb. But this car will do the quarter mile in 14.1 and zero to 60 in 5.5 seconds. It's made it to a six speed transmission. It's making uh, 272 horsepower, 294 foot pounds of torque. The torque is what makes a car feel light. It doesn't feel like it's working hard. It really is effortless torque. And that also makes for great responsiveness, even on the highway. The transmission in this car is a six-speed automatic. It does have a manual mode. And I found the manual mode only comes in handy if you're doing a little spirited driving through the turns. If you leave it in drive and you enter a corner and you slow down a little bit and then start to get back on it again, the shift delay is pretty slow. So you end up with oversteers, you enter the corner, and then it kicks down and uh, kind of quickly you end up with uh, understeer. It's a sudden weight distribution snap as it shifts mid-turn. It's actually pretty uncomfortable. And that's true about the handling. Until you hit this button. And the very laws of nature change. Welcome to sports mode. Now, I don't want to over-exaggerate what happens to the car, because it's very subtle, but drastic. And I mean, in an incredible way. All of a sudden, you feel like you've just stepped into a truly tuned sports car. The on-center feel improved. Feedback on the steering wheel got stiffer. Everything changed. The dynamics of the vehicle changed. Entering a corner while just in drive, no more nose plow. I thought it was just going to be shift points. I thought it was just going to be slightly different shifting, staying at a higher RPM for longer, or staying in gear longer. But instead, this? This is a whole different car. I don't even want to take it out of sport mode. It feels so good. It is so confidence inspiring. I like the way it felt in tour mode. But until I noticed that button, I had no idea what this car was capable of. It's firm without being abusive. Wow, I am so impressed with this car. <sighs> this car is also specced with all-wheel drive. Living in Vermont, I had to have all-wheel drive. I've had light cars before that were front-wheel drive only. Even with snow tires, they work pretty hard to get down the road. 
So all wheel drive was a must in a lighter vehicle. This thing weighs 3,400 pounds. My Ford Edge weighed, I wanna say 4,200 pounds. And it, it stomped through the snow with front wheel drive, but it was heavy and all that weight was on the nose. So I'm excited to see how well this performs in all wheel drive. From videos I've seen on YouTube, it shows a very intelligent all wheel drive system that balances weight, uh, that balances traction to each wheel individually. And uh, it seems to be very effective even in uh, icy conditions. So I'm looking forward to that. And I'll follow up this winter with a review of its all wheel drive capability. The car is also a five passenger. That was in must. I have five people in my family. When I bought a motorcycle, my kids were so confused. Where do we sit? <laughs> so they very much enjoy that they were included in the decision to buy this vehicle. The back seats are a little small. With the booster seats, the kids' feet are kind of up and their legs stick straight out. And so their feet do make contact with the seats in front of them. However, it's not bad. They do fit. Uh, but I'm six foot two. When I sit in the back, I'm definitely touching my head on the ceiling. Uh, it's a little low. It's a little small. Um, but 90% of the time, it's just going to be it's just going to be me commuting in this vehicle back and forth to work. So we have a minivan, and that accommodates the real family need for traveling any big distances. This is fine, taking them to school, uh, dropping off, running local trips. Everyone's comfortable. Because this is a base model, the car has the 17-inch polished, semi-polished aluminum wheels with 225, 45, uh, 17s, and they're run flats. And the reason they're run flats, I know some cars have run flats um, as a convenience, but this car has run flats out of necessity. It actually has no spare tire. Now from the factory, the car comes with a little car tire repair kit in the back. Uh, I guess uh, I've never seen it. I can of fix a flat, I guess. Um, but that's missing. So I'll have to pick up a can myself. I did throw my little air compressor in the back just in case I need it. I was a little surprised there was no spare, but at the same time, it's one of those things that I used to do with hot rods. Uh, it's dead weight and you kind of ride the risk. And with run flats or fix a flat, whatever. I'm also guessing it had something to do with Cadillac's desire for weight reduction. Also, this car has a perfect 50-50 weight distribution front to rear. That ties into the handling tremendously. And this car does handle very well. Another cool thing, when I opened up the trunk to look for the spare, what I found was there was a battery in the back. That's really cool. That's like drag racing and car racing technology. There's not a lot of cars putting the battery in the trunk. But again, back to weight distribution, balance. It all works together. Everything is so well thought out in this car. Trunk space wise, uh, a buddy of mine said you could only fit one or two bodies back there. I'm sure making a joke to my Cadillac and uh, some kind of mobster mafia tie-in. But it's, uh, I think I read 10 cubic feet. It's good size, but it's not huge. Uh, but again, small car, not a big car. No SUV. <laughs> I'm done with SUVs. All right, on the efficiency side. You know, it's, it's getting a little difficult to argue the mile per gallon in a smaller vehicle. That full-size Ford F-150 that I drove for a number of months was able to maintain 20 miles per gallon with city driving with a 5 liter V8 and a 10 speed automatic transmission 20 miles per gallon that thing had to weigh 7,000 pounds so sometimes I think if they just put that drivetrain in a car that weighed 3,400 pounds it'd get what 40 at least 30 right but this one in the city, I'm hovering right around 26. When I first got it, before I cleaned it up, before I did some work on it, I was getting 24 miles per gallon, and that was a struggle. I had to drive it like a baby to maintain 24. Now with normal driving on this thing, I reset the dash computer on the mile per gallon, and it's reading 26.1. Uh, when I jump on the highway, it jumps up into the 30s. That's really good for a car with nearly 300 horsepower. And all-wheel drive. The interior of the car is really nice. Leather, the fit and finish is fantastic. The qualities even of the plastics are excellent. And there's kind of this satin charcoal finish trim around the interior that's just elegant. 
very small chrome accents, brushed aluminum. It's a beautiful balance. Uh, a number of people that have looked inside, their first response is, wow, that's a fancy car. But also the feel of the interior. The leather is excellent. The seats feel great. They look attractive. Right, they're not the V's Recaro seats, but they're supportive enough and they're comfortable on long trips. The cruise control is excellent. You set the mile per hour and it holds it. And the engine has enough power that even going up hills, it holds your mile per hour. The thing that I thought was funny was going down a hill. It's extremely aggressive in engine braking. So strong that sometimes it felt like it's actually applying the brakes. It'll hold that mile per hour that you define no matter what. The air conditioning's ice cold and the fan blows harder than any car I've ever been in. This cabin cools off really quick on hot days and I'm sure in the winter time when it gets really cold I'm going to appreciate how fast uh, it heats up the cabin as well. The dash layout is pretty easy. I put the speedometer right in the middle. I've got tire pressure gauge uh, on the left to all four corners it reads and it's live. It's very dynamic data updating it seems like in the seconds and then mile per gallon on the right because I really like to try to control my right foot. Uh, on the top right there's a fuel gauge, easy to read, uh, temperature gauge, and uh, RPM gauge as well. The radio's uh, a little confusing. It's uh, the base radio, it's not the Q system. This is the base model Cadillac. It has Bluetooth for the phone, the voice activation's great, but I have to use a three and a half millimeter cable to plug in to listen to music. That's a little old school for me, but, um, but again, this is the base model. It's uh, the Q system. I'm sure if you bought the 2018 system, it would be Bluetooth everywhere. But for some reason, programmatically, this only allows phone. There's two USB ports for charging. There's also a slot for an old three and a half, I'm sorry, I was gonna say three and a half inch floppy. There's also a memory card slot that you can fill up with music and stick it in there and just select media auxiliary or media whatever it is. The radio sounds fantastic. It's Bose speakers. I don't know if there's amplification or, or what the level of amplification is, but it sounds amazing. When I first got in, I was very disappointed that uh, the Bose system didn't sound that great. I know what Bose is capable of, but especially GM radios with Bose, they typically sound fantastic. This sounded flat, no sound separation. So I dug in and I sought out the EQ settings and I adjusted it and it sounded way better. Still not as good as I hoped. My experience and my background in selling electronics, I know if you have a pure sound source, and our radio stations around here are not very good, that usually higher end systems come to life because they are designed to bring out every detail. And that's exactly what happened. I, I grabbed Pandora, I put it on high quality output, plugged it into my three and a half millimeter cable, but hey, there's no sound distortion, right? Or minimal. And it sounded amazing. Uh, it has incredible bass response with no distortion, very clean, very crisp, very full, uh, mids, highs, there's tweeters up on the dash. I believe there's also a center channel right here. And uh, rear speakers as well. Oh, I think it's an 8 or a 10 speaker system. Regardless, it sounds fantastic. I'm extremely happy with it. I'm usually motivated to buy subwoofers and work on a stereo system, but not with this car. I'm happy it's done. Uh, one annoyance that I had when I first got the car, I'm six foot two, so my legs kind of go a little too deep into the foot wells. So I had to work to find that perfect spot. Once I did, the dealer had covered these great winter floor mats, which keep the salt and grime from getting on the carpet. So I didn't want to replace them. But where my foot rests is a downhill towards the gas pedal. It was so slippery, I was holding my leg up to try to keep it from sliding into that hole. Uh, and so I got a cramp in my hip. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's real. I said that, I got a cramp in my hip. Uh, <laughs> so to fix it, I needed traction. So I pulled the mat out and I cleaned it and I scrubbed it to get that really ridiculous slippery slime off of it that didn't help so I decided though I want the winter mats especially for around here in Vermont there's mud everywhere and snow and grime and salt everywhere I wanted these good quality mats so what I did is I went on Amazon and I found skateboard sticky tape it's like sandpaper on the top it came in the mail it was like eight bucks for a big roll 
came in the mail, I cut it out, and I placed it perfectly on after I cleaned it on the winterized mat, just an area about yay big uh, where my foot goes. And it's phenomenal. It just grips my shoe. It doesn't seem to be wearing out my shoe either and holds it firmly in place. It doesn't slip around and it's not uncomfortable. So solution, that was a good one. Uh, overall, my impressions of the vehicle, I'll give them to you in just a minute. I gotta go eat some lunch. So where were we? Back in the mid 90s, I was looking for a job advertising student. I landed one in Detroit at a company called DMBNB. They were an advertising agency just outside of Detroit in Bloomfield Hills. The GM clients called it the country club because we were just surrounded in rolling hills and green grass. After a little bit of entry level work, I got thrown onto an account executive team where I worked with some very talented folks to develop an ad campaign for a new car, the Cadillac Terra. It was a rebadged Opal. And what was going on at the time at Cadillac was the average buyer at that time was something like 67 years old. And every year they were getting older. The average just kept creeping up. Cadillac knew they were in serious trouble and they had to redefine themselves. But when you've been doing the same thing for a real long time, it's seriously difficult to change the way you do things. It's just nearly impossible, seemingly. So during that time at Cadillac, I watched them roll out some two-door sports cars, 300 horsepower front-wheel drive, aluminum drive shafts, traction control, state-of-the-art stuff. And something really cool started happening. 40-year-olds started buying Cadillacs. That was impressive. But back then, we still had this perception that it's an old person's car. So it was a long, long haul. So buying this car to me, what is that? Many years later, <laughs> back in the 1900s, uh, means something more to me than maybe what's just on the surface. I like this car very much. It's amazing, the handling, the performance, the efficiency, the look, the materials, there is no negative in my head other than I am worried about the intake valves and carbon buildup. But I'll deal with that as I need to. But this car represents the vision Cadillac had back in 1995, where they needed to go and what they needed to be. And to drive this car now, not having seen or experienced much of anything from Cadillac since I left there in the mid 90s is like a time machine. It's it's I'm applauding Cadillac for what they've accomplished. And I knew from working there what they were facing and the hurdles they had to overcome. It was a serious culture change and they did it. And I know it wasn't easy. But then there's another layer as a marketing guy. Did the brand perception change? So when I bought this car, I expected a lot of jokes about, oh, you bought a Cadillac and something about AARP and retirement and such. Nope. You know what I heard even from young people? Wow, it's a Cadillac, seriously? As if, wow, you can afford a Cadillac? That's amazing, wow, you have a Cadillac. In other words, they were impressed by the brand name. They knew what it represented. Which means Cadillac was able to not only transition to more youthful cars and excellent engineering, but they were able to manage the brand down into even the youngest generation that sees this car as something impressive. I'm excited for Cadillac. I applaud Cadillac for what they've accomplished. This big, giant company was able to change and deliver this. Fantastic car. 2015 ATS 2.0T. Would I recommend it? Yeah, definitely. But only if you know a little bit about working on cars. If not, Look for something other than a GDI engine. But Cadillac? Oh yeah, definitely.